Hello and welcome everyone. Today is Thursday, uh, December 15th. Uh, we're going to have Lucas Newsy presenting a bit of a FTX recap. Uh, and um, yeah, just to, to start off, uh, you know, some uh, general announcements. This is going to be our last community call of the year. Uh, and we'll be uh, putting them on pause heading into the new year for now. Uh, and we'll have some uh, some general announcements coming out uh, early in the uh, in the new year. Um, but yeah, I think uh, at, uh, today uh, we did have, I know we, we had our uh, final episode of the Block Science podcast come out this week uh, with Jessica Zartler, uh, more focusing on governance and community. Uh, so yeah, that, that is available everywhere you listen to podcasts. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know if anyone does have any other quick things to plug. Otherwise, I will just hand it off right to Lucas so we can get into it. Yeah, if anyone does remember anything, please feel free to drop it in chat. But Lucas, I'll uh, pass it off to you uh, to, uh, yeah, just go dive right in and, and provide the, the recap you were so gracious to offer to, to go over today. Yeah, sure. And I think, um, th yeah, there's been some really interesting developments uh, with FTX lately, a, a lot that's coming out in congressional hearings and, you know, in testimonies uh, we know now that uh, there were a lot of insiders that were that played a role in bringing down uh, FTX and SPF specifically but uh, my um, you know focus in this whole situation was looking at the on-chain part of the story and trying to understand if there were any warning signs that signaled liquidity problems um, at FTX, and uh, there are multiple types of analysis that you can do to uh, assess that. Um, I decided to focus on flow analysis to see the inflows and outflows of both FTX wallets uh, as well as um, uh, Alameda Research, which is a fund that was uh, very connected with the operations of FTX. It was the founding uh, partner of FTX, and uh, my you know journey in you know understanding the on-chain part of the story was um really centered around the ftt token initially uh i sensed some desperation uh by both alameda research and ftx uh early november in trying to defend the price of ftt there were some rumors that um you know they're issuing loans using FTT tokens as collateral, which, you know, it's a big no-no if you're using as collateral an asset that you yourself issue. It can be problematic because if you have the ability to issue the asset, you can just debase that asset for all the users whenever you need to. And that is a lot of, uh, that's a, a, a huge conflict, especially in the context of using it as a collateral. So. I set out to better understand how the dynamics of FTT were early in November. Um, and it was, you know, used for very large transfers. But one thing that piqued my curiosity was something that actually happened late September of this year. It was a multi billion dollar FTT transfer. Um, and one of the largest ERC 20 transfers were. Or, sequences of ERC-20 transfers that have ever happened uh, or that we ever captured at CoinMetrics. Um, so I decided to actually look at that transfer because early November, there was this convergence on their relationship with the FTT token, the ways the FTT, the FTT token was, was used. So I wanted to see if there were anything, anything unusual about FTT transfers uh this year so i came across this transaction on uh september 28th uh, between the vesting contract of the ftt ico so ftt did an ico back in 2019 when ftx was um, getting started the role of, of the ftt token was to provide um uh, uh, discount tiers for traders that were using ftx so if you're moving large amounts of liquidity within 
FTX, you could use the FTT token to prove that you're you know, part of the system and, and a stakeholder in that system, and you receive trading discounts amongst various other things. Um, FTT as a token was structured uh, similarly to Binance's BNB token. I think FTX, uh, their strategy was really focused on replicating Binance, but with a bigger focus on derivatives. And because Alameda Research, uh, you know, Sam Bankman Free's fund um, was already, you know, making use of all these strategies uh, focused on both derivatives and uh, arbitrage trading between East and West. Uh, Alameda Research's fund played a key role in bootstrapping FTX. Um, so they had this model very similar to Binance's uh, tokenized model with a little bit more focus on derivatives and um, algo trading. You know, Sam has a background in algo trading at Jane Street, which is a big fund in the space. And what basically happened was as a result of their role in bootstrapping FTX, Alameda Research received a pretty substantial amount of FTT tokens in 2019. They also had other folks contribute to the bootstrapping of the FTX exchange. And uh, as a reward, they received both FTT tokens as well as equity in FTX. Both the equity and the FTT tokens were treated very similarly in the sense that they were subject to a vesting schedule. And a vesting schedule basically means you can't just sell them in the open market all at once. You're susceptible to like this uh, schedule where if you received, you know, 10 million FTT tokens as a result of your uh, participation in bootstrapping uh, the project or an exchange. You're not going to receive it all at once. You're going to receive it in predetermined uh, and scheduled disbursements. And that relationship with Alameda and the FTT token existed. They received a massive allocation of FTT tokens that was subject to a vesting schedule. And that vesting schedule, one of the biggest, uh, what's called a cliff, which is one, you know, a, a larger percentage of um, what was allocated is disbursed, was actually in September. It was on September 28th. And that was the transaction that I found. Uh, on September 28th, there, there was this transaction from the FTT ICO back when FTX was just starting. They implemented this vesting schedule. Uh, they did an ICO, but because there was a vesting schedule, Alameda Research did not receive all their tokens all at once. It was set to vest on September 28th of this year. And what ended up happening was that as it was setting, as it was set to vest, um, Alameda was about to receive billions of dollars worth of FTT tokens. Um, and it was effectively operating uh, in a very adverse market condition. So crypto markets collapsed, you know, in Q4 of last year. Uh, this has been a very painful year of continued decreases in, in valuations. And um, there's a possibility that because of Alameda Research's basic operations as a fund, that it also was impacted by um, uh, all the contractions in the market, uh, the collapse of, of Luna, um, the massive devaluations across all layer one protocols that they've invested in. So this transaction was very important uh, or telling because it, it, it started painting a story around Alameda's true financial standing. Because the moment they received the FTT transaction, the FTT transfer from the ICO contract that had just vest vested, that cliff hit, the moment they received that, they sent it back to FTX. And it was almost like a, a repayment of sorts. Um, and to us, that was very concerning because 
they were supposed to be two completely different uh, entities, right? Why would Alameda Research send back the majority of funds that it received from the FTT ICO back to FTX, who basically issued those tokens? And that really started like this big rabbit hole of um, better understanding what was Alameda's true financial standing. Um, we know there are addresses on the blockchain, and the initial analysis was really trying to see what that tra transfer um, represented. And we ultimately landed on a, on a hypothesis that Alameda Research actually blew up just like every other fund that were that was you know engaging this type of, of of strategy where you're market neutral you're investing heavily in uh derivatives something happened to alameda at some point they uh were effectively uh operating at a net loss ftx had to come in at some point in before september to bail them out and that FTT transfer, that gigantic four plus billion dollar transfer of FTT tokens was actually a repayment uh, for that bailout. At least that's the hypothesis that we we landed. And uh, that was even before FTX had filed for Chapter 11. Uh, it was before the liquidity uh, concerns were exacerbated by their unilateral like, pausing of withdrawals. So it was it was a very interesting find. Um, but that was just really the beginning of the rabbit hole. There was a lot more that uh, we uncovered um, after that. But I'll pause there. I know it's a lot in terms of, of context, but um, see if there's any questions or you know, reactions to this. Yeah, thank you for for sharing the for sharing all that. It's fascinating to to imagine uh, both in terms of your position where you're kind of sitting there and realizing this, and sort of the actual just personal emotional journey of like, holy crap, am I really finding what I'm finding here? Uh, and then on the other side, to also imagine sort of what is the future, you know, too big to fail movie made on this, uh, and like the dramatizations of the boardrooms where the discussions were happening because it's you know if it's actually if, it, if we, if not thinking in the abstract, but thinking of like, you know, Sam and a few other people in a room making decisions, like what, what, what did the, the realistic governance structure around these decisions look like? And who the hell thought they were a good idea? Uh, yeah, it's just uh, kind of crazy to think about uh, when, when you hear all of it laid out. Yeah, it's probably very dramatic in the, in the background because there, were, there was no boardroom, right? They had no board. It was really, Sam and a handful of other folks that were involved in making those decisions, right? And I think there was likely a couple of trades that went really wrong for Alameda that Sam and everyone around him were very likely familiar with, where the decision was made of, well, they had two options. One, we let Alameda blow up. And remember, this is before September. So if they were to blow up, all those billions of, of dollars worth of FTT tokens that were to receive, uh, that, that you know Alameda was set to receive because of the vesting schedule in September, they would be liquidated in the open market. That's what happens when funds go under, right? They have to liquidate everything to make all of their LPs whole again. So it was really a, a binary decision we either let alameda blow up and as a result ftx because of their connection with alameda also takes a hit or we bail out alameda research and because we have no cash because we made some really bad investments as ftx we have to use user funds as a result of that and, and it's it's very clear now that it was really the latter they've decided to uh, effectively bail out Alameda uh, as confirmed by various whistleblowers, by the existing governors of, uh, of, of FTX now, the new CEO and all of the 
folks uh, you know involved with the restructuring of, of FTX uh, instead of being honest and not breaching their terms of use uh, and effectively siphoning user funds um, uh, not siphoning user funds rather they decided to actually use user funds in this context which is clearly you know fraud absolutely and if anyone does have questions please feel free to to raise your virtual hand or drop them in chat but paul please yeah i want to take this chance to you know, after kind of that context right like uh reading about this right this is a kind of like a crypto story ultimately right because it's ftx and crypto markets and all this type of stuff but like really if this is a fraud story right this is a person committing fraud um right and kind of just doing corrupt behaviors that we have seen before so i'm kind of interested on your take of like is there actually a positive crypto story here where a person like yourself because of the nature of blockchain and the transactions there can actually start to get to this sooner um whereas you know if this was a traditional type of fraud which is a fun content or a fun idea um it probably would not have been identified in the same type of way so is there kind of a positive here? Yeah, I think that the transparency aspect of it is definitely something unique to this technology and that enables you to, you know, reason about um, an entity's financial health uh, more objectively by actually auditing their operations. Um, it's sad because this is a classic case of, of, of fraud, right? Uh, and it's probably one of the biggest uh, instances of financial fraud in the history of finance. Uh, and it happened in a context where you had this transparency, right? So I think what this really highlighted to me and, and, and even talking to folks and trying to explain, you know, our findings is that, uh, the transparency aspect of crypto assets and, and, and blockchains is vastly unutilized. Uh, this type of analysis is not really done by the folks that should be doing it like the vcs the uh, banking partners uh the the auditors and the big issue behind this is it's not because of a lack of um uh, will to do it i think it's really uh, this dichotomy of the space has received a lot of attention a lot of capital but the expertise to be able to do this is just not there yet. Um, some folks that are responsible for diligence, they're not even aware that they can do this type of analysis to better understand the risk profile of the entities that they're interacting with. So it is ironic in a lot of ways that this happened in the context of crypto where that information was there since September 28th, right? uh no one was actively uh looking uh at this like it took someone you know like me who really i had no uh exposure to ftx whatsoever uh it was really just trying to contextualize what was happening uh not from the position of a regulator uh a user just really okay let's see what's actually going on behind the scenes and there was this glaring smoking gun right that um everyone kind of just failed to notice and i think the big uh takeaway for me is that you know on-chain analysis is a very unique and positive thing with uh crypto assets there just isn't much um uh, expertise and, and tooling as well to make it easier for other folks to do better due diligence. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a net negative, unfortunately, because this is still, you know, hurting a lot of people. Uh, it's still, you know, giving regulators the worst ideas. Uh, and there are risks with it too, right? Um, I, I'm a privacy advocate. Like I've been researching privacy in the context of, of blockchains for years now, and, that was part of what intrigued me the first you know, about you know on-chain analysis was trying to break 
privacy solutions. And there are ways they can break privacy solutions. Um, but on-chain analysis is also, if you think about like this like morality of privacy, uh, it can also be overdone, right? I I, I follow kind of my own uh, code of conduct. I never de-anonymize individuals, docs, users. Uh, but I think, uh, and my concern is that because of the scale that this fraud entails, that maybe regulators, maybe the 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 pseudo the pseudonymous nature of blockchains, I think it's it's at risk right now uh, because people will overemphasize now. I think on chain analysis to the point where. Uh, maybe they won't draw a line between what's infringing with users' privacy versus what is making sure that uh, folks that are taking custody of user funds are being, you know, uh, there's accountability for these for these folks. So still kind of struggling. I think we're in a really interesting uh, point in the history of blockchains where we're kind of juggling between the, those lines but as a privacy advocate i i hope that we move to a future where uh we focus on really making sure that these uh entities especially those that are taking custody of user funds are being responsible with their with their operations yeah, yeah john do you want to jump in yeah i think you you highlighted a very interesting uh, aspect of it, it's it's custodial fraud. It's it's fraud from a central authority, um, and that perhaps another benefit to this is it reminds folks in the space the decentralized nature of cryptocurrencies there for a reason, and it just keeps making me think of like the fraud of the U.S. dollar in 2008. Right? It's a very similar story. They can issue their own currency. There's these banks that are tied to a governance structure. One of them goes under, so they just issue some currency and bail out the other side of it. And a lot of people suffer. Like if you replace user funds with tax dollars, you know, they tap into the user funds to do it. It's, there's a lot of similarities between uh, these two events that are just boil down to their centralized control over assets. Yeah, it, that's that's uh, it's an interesting parallel because in in 2008, if you look at the source of the collapse, uh, you know there were securities that were being traded, uh, especially uh, uh, CDOs and mortgage-backed securities, where in order to understand what they represented, you'd have to be a legal scholar willing to read a 500-plus page contract that actually represents that security. You have to speculate uh, what would be the execution uh, outcome of this if it went to litigation. It was a massive failure in financial engineering, right? Whereas in this space, you have that the potential at least of full transparency. We, for example, like in our analysis, we were able to understand also what are the other entities that had exposure to FTX uh, and very quickly determined that, you know, contagion was very likely, uh, that really it wasn't just FTX that was exposed to this, you know, similar to what happened in, in 2008. Um, I think there are some positives in it too, right? Because I feel like there were some really interesting lessons that were learned of what is the true value proposition of, of this technology. It's not to get rich quick, unfortunately, right? It's not something that uh, you can just create an account here and just buy whatever tokens being shielded to you and you're gonna be okay. Uh, I think folks are, there is this sense of, of, of opportunity that gets people excited about crypto, but that, that shouldn't be the biggest value proposition. Uh, and I think, that was the major ethos of FTX. It was get rich quick, uh, keep your money with us. Uh, we are responsible. We're talking to all these regulators, right? Uh, and you know, a positive out of this is that self custody is at an all time high. Uh, folks are desperate about potentially losing funds as a result of continuous contagion. We're seeing what's happening with Binance right now. 
uh, billions of dollars being withdrawn from Binance, basically test their books. I think that is a net positive. And this is ultimately how we get to a point where the true value proposition of blockchains is uh, basically capitalized because that is a prerequisite. Holding your own assets is a prerequisite to see all the benefits in you know using DeFi, in controlling your own data, in you know having better user access to applications. Um, a prerequisite of all of this is to hold your own crypto. And this is a very painful lesson in why you need to hold your own crypto. But uh, if you look at some interesting uh, metrics, uh, uh, the, the counts of addresses holding at least $1 worth of crypto assets is at an all-time high right now. Um, folks have withdrawn heavily from all these exchanges. And uh, I think it was a painful lesson, but in terms of the trend, uh, it is something that makes me more hopeful that uh, you know that that prerequisite to actually capitalize on the true value proposition of this technology, I think is now being met. It's unfortunate that it took this scale of an event to to get to this point. Great, thank you. Ralph, did you want to jump in? Lucas, when you when you talk about the idea of um, getting to a 100% decentralized, transparent world, obviously that means that there are, you're going to run into a whole bunch of entities that don't want that because they want control or they want, you know, they want their data, they want to hold it and, and hoard it and so on. So um, how, how transparent and decentralized can we get in the short term? And can we do it uh, effectively just in a kind of non-federated state? Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, idealistic views on this. Um, I tend to be a realist when it comes to this decentralized future, which I, I do think it's an inevitable that we get because the structures that, blockchains provide in terms of uh, sharing profits, providing users better control. I think they're going to be uh, irresistible to Web3 businesses as they breach into social networks, as they breach into various areas in tech right now that are dominated by these um, structures of power that are toxic in nature, right? You you are the product. Uh, it's almost like um, it's ripe for uh, a blockchain service to um, uh, really take over and, and, and enable as a result of this, not only better control around your privacy, but as a byproduct of this, also give you a better experience because now maybe your social network is monetizing and you're making money out of it. There's a, a transparent profit sharing with the services that you engage with. Um, so I think I, I'm, I'm much more realistic about what this, this transition will look like. And I think we've had some examples of how unproductive being extremely idealistic is at this point. So if you look at all of the attempts at creating decentralized social networks, uh, the the burden on the user is just so gigantic that none of them get traction. I think there's we're gonna see a transition period where uh, the applications that will be successful at this point are applications that abstract away like even the notion that there is a blockchain involved. Uh, where you're really just interacting with a service, that service might retain you know, your data and uh, resell it on an anonymized basis to folks that want to buy machine learning models uh, or to advertisers. And you're in the background getting paid in USD or your currency of choice 
and effectively having the same functionality that's provisioned by these services, which from a functionality perspective, the, what these services, the way that they're structured is getting increasingly, increasingly commoditized. Uh, if you think about the back end of uh, a service like Facebook, we're at a point right now where that is not no longer as novel as it once was. So it's really how do you expand the set of services and the intrinsic like business model behind this to make sure that this is successful. And to me, there's no other route really that excites me more than adding, you know, a blockchain component to the back end of these services that is not connected to users, maybe initially as a, as this transition stage, but that can still enable you to have the value proposition of having a blockchain in the first place, uh, which mostly relates to like monetization, uh, control of uh, user interactions uh, on a you know time stamped and se sequential basis. And I think we've had some really interesting ideas as of late of, of how that transition uh, and, and Web3 as a concept, as abstract as, as it might be right now, uh, can actually succeed in a more realistic sense. So I, I do think this is the next step, right? Uh, I think we've, we've, we've gotten really impacted by this constant um, value proposition uh, being basically that one that you're going to get rich quick and you just buy these tokens, you hold it with third parties. And, uh, and you know, this is an intrinsically human uh, uh, desire, right? Uh, people want to grow their wealth. Uh, it's just unfortunate because if the value proposition of this industry is centered around that, you're bound to have people getting hurt, either because the assets themselves are incredibly volatile and there isn't enough focus on building products around it, or because of collapses, because of these third parties, because they're not banks, they're not exchanges, they're a whole new type of financial institution uh, with substantially less controls than the status quo. So I tend to be more realistic about this. I think the successful uh, applications of you know Web 3.1, if you want to call it, is um, are those that have very nice user interfaces clear value proposition, leverage blockchain strategically and not impose them on their users. Uh, there's this beauty of, of using it for what it's good for and not really uh, putting it on your user's face to the point that your service becomes unusable and as a result, it won't be successful. John, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I completely agree with everything you're saying. And the trends you highlighted earlier, uh, fantastic. And so there's another trend I want to highlight, and then it, it ends with a question. And so the trend is just the scale of these things, like Mt. Gox, Cripsy, MintPal. There was that one in Canada where the guy just ran away. We still haven't found him or something like that. And now we have this giant multi-billion dollar one. So with that trend, does it feel like we've kind of gone exponential and this might be the last one? that's really of this scale, that's traditional system fraud, central entity, that sort of thing. And then if that's the case, do you think that we're gonna start seeing maybe more failures due to experimentation with the technology, similar to Luna, where they're like actually trying to do something novel in maybe a great way, maybe a not so great way, but they're trying to do something novel with this new tech and it didn't work. And that you can say what you want about it, but that I would argue that's a better failure than like a centralized entity committing fraud. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think uh, there's definitely a couple of areas where um, it, it, it makes me hopeful that this is the last failure of this magnitude. Um, but yeah, I guess the failure mode in a lot of ways will, will shift. Uh, I don't think we're at a point today, unfortunately, that entails that every user is safe holding their own uh crypto right so I've, I've i've also worked in building custody products for for a long time and there is 
there's no, you know, converged upon uh, strategy to secure your your seed uh, values that basically create your private keys. Um, so there are huge UI um, issues, um, uh, UI UX issues that prevent self custody from getting from you know proliferating, and I think. Uh, there are failures that will emerge as a result of this as well. You know, comparing to like when I first like tried a multi-sig in you know 2012, I'll tell you things have gotten substantially better. Um, the the use of uh, HSMs, uh, the the simplicity of HSMs on the user front um, have drastically improved that process. Uh, on the institutional front, uh, if you look at you know bigger entities, there's been this trend of using uh, what's called multi-party computation (MPC) to structure your your custody in a multi-sig way. And uh, with MPC, there is there are some benefits in terms of transparency, where uh, you can have signers of your of your wallets disclose uh, addresses and provide proofs off-chain of, of ownership so that you can guarantee that they are uh, solvents uh, or that they have the assets that they claim that they have without even thinking too much about liabilities. I think even just relative to the status quo, I don't think there's going to be a centralized exchange that will survive without this from now on. Um, really being diligent about proving both their assets and their liabilities on-chain. So. All of that makes me think that this is, in fact, the the last um, massive failure uh, that we didn't have to go through, but we did. Um, I think the failure modes will change. We'll likely have issues that are considerable related to self custody, um, but there are always going to be opportunities there too for companies to focus on this. Uh, there hasn't really been a whole lot of competition on the HSM fronts or even on the solutions fronts for wallets. The big reason behind this is that the majority of users uh, thus far have relied upon these centralized third parties to hold their assets. Um, in a universe where that is now frowned upon, we're going to start to see more innovation, better products, better user experience at the wallet level, uh, which is all you know very positive for the industry uh it's scary in some ways it does entail some new uh types of maybe not new types of failure modes but um increased incidence i guess of these more niche failure modes related to uh potentially losing your seat uh, keys or uh, bugs at the wallet level but the scale of those will likely be substantially smaller and not systematic uh, if, if you um, if you compare that with something like FTX. Yeah, and I wonder in coming back to the to the privacy element and some of what you were alluding to with some of the potential say process changes around hey centralized exchanges you now have to conform with this reporting structure in a similar way that you know, banks and other financial institutions have to conform with kind of regulated disclosure. Um, and on the other hand, there's the tool side. There's the, like you were saying, the wallets and, um, but also thinking of from the regulator perspective and uh, thinking of other areas where there is surveillance of different kind, is there the possibility of, uh, you know, like there are groups and I, I don't mean to single out positively or negatively by any way, but say like a group like Chainalysis that I know has been around for a while that is doing like on-chain analytics. And, uh, you know, is this going to kind of encourage more and more groups arising in that direction and trying to replicate, you know, these, uh, say, in other domains, like what the NSO group or other groups that, that play, you know, interesting roles in the nature of surveillance globally? And, like, what does that actually mean towards, like, the, you know, the, the individual interaction level? And is that going to be more of a push for, like, cryptographically secured uh, individual interactions and not just the self-custody? Uh, I think we're moving to an interesting uh, regulatory paradigm. I think a lot of 
lobbyists were made were maybe able to make the argument that chain analysis was sufficient, right? Subscribing to chain analysis and checking uh, your users' AML KYC uh, would be sufficient to bank them. I think there's a whole new type of analysis that uh, these entities will be required to do that um, is very different than you know chain analysis, you know existing product sets, um, and it is concerning to me that um, there's going to be more focus on building these tools because um, even as a non-chain analyst, I, uh, as I mentioned, sometimes na navigate through this through this line, right? Uh, am I, you know, looking at specific user uh, interactions? And I do think it's going to be inevitable. If you think about the data structure used by these blockchains today, um, they offer no privacy whatsoever. I mean, especially account account based blockchains like Ethereum, uh, it, it, it's very very trivial to follow user interactions and cluster user addresses. Um, even if you if you use you know hundred addresses, uh, if you have enough uh, time, you can cluster all of them, and that really hurts the privacy at the individual level. I think it also uh, makes the entire space susceptible to capture by surveillance and new types of MLQIC emerging that are a lot more subjective. Um, so I'm very mindful of this. I have a, a, a big interest in privacy preserving technologies. I think there's a compromised future where privacy does not hurt verifiability and we have technologies that enable us to do that today right if you look at uh this you know cambrian explosion of, of zk technologies uh especially zk snarks um it is very reassuring because you can transact privately as a user um and as an institution and disclose your identity to specific parties through what's called the uh, verification key. So you have two sets of keys for these technologies if you're a user, one that enables you to transact, sign transactions, and a, a different set of keys that enables you to uh, prove that you are the entity behind those transactions. For privacy, this is the ideal scenario in my opinion, because it enables you to selectively disclose things that you have to disclose or that you know will, will likely to be required for you to disclose um, uh, while at the same time not exposing the entirety of your of your balance not exposing the entirety of your interactions with the blockchain uh, really doing that in a way that um, uh, is focused on you know transparency maximizing transparency especially as it relates to folks that are um, holding assets on, be on behalf of, of third parties. Um, it's very reassuring that kind of this is the, the way to go because we've seen a massive, very underappreciated um, progression in these technologies, and especially recently with uh, technologies like Planck, which we've covered in the forum. Um, the efficiency and security of these uh, technologies has improved drastically relative to even 2018. So my you know, ideal future is one where the Ethereum-based layer is maybe uh, the public square. I think it's still going to, in the, in the time being, be uh, transparent and with very little privacy assurances. But you're going to have these uh, roll-ups where the majority of activity will take place and where uh, transparency uh, is uh, programmatic. You can be transparent if you want to by you know signing something with your your verification key and, and exposing that your your entity behind this and the values associated with the transactions that you've you've interacted with. But it won't be something that it's going to be an opt-in 
as, as opposed to the current status quo, which is, you know, no users are safe, like all of your balances are public. And if, if it takes one with uh, determination to just de-anonymize you. Uh, so that, that's my hope. There are some very interesting new technologies that are coming out that will make uh, this optional privacy future um, a lot more feasible and with several side benefits like scalability uh, also being proved by adopting these technologies. Yeah, thank you for uh, for outlining that potential future. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of uh, interesting threads to potentially uh, unravel there. But uh, Chris, did you want to jump in? Yes, um, thank you very much for this. And based on your analysis um, of the Almeida FTX um, bailout situation, does it seem like anybody else looked at this transaction chain before to discover this um, relationship? Because then my question from there would be, if they didn't, is there some sort of occlusion through uh, data um, lake, like accumulation of data too quickly for people to actually discern what's happening? And then in that context, um, if anybody had gone and looked at that data without knowing that there was anything happening, would they even be able to discern that something shady had occurred. So like in that context, uh, does the public data actually mean anything without some sort of context? Like I know as an analyst, you have some sort of history to give you context and maybe you were able to figure it out. Like, would you have been able to discern what you discovered without being hinted at it and directed towards it? It's a great question. Um, the way that I like to put it is that, so blockchains, they're transparent, but all the information that you received from just running a node is not legible, at least at this point. Um, so you can see it, you have some metadata around it to add context to it, but it's not legible in the sense that you can't really read the meaning of this transaction and its entire um, impact um, other than this account got debited, this account got credited, and these are you know the logs that were emitted. So it is a huge problem in terms of um, performing this type of analysis. Um, so, you know, Equimetrics, we run all these exporters that sit on top of the nodes that we run. And these exporters, their role is to add context to those transfers. Uh, for example, like it can be as simple as multiplying uh, the uh, outputs of a transaction with the price of the asset that's being transacted at that point in time. Right, uh, that adds context as to like a real world, like monetary value uh, that's more tangible than just uh, what we call native units, right? The, the token units that are being transacted. Um, but there's a lot more that you can you can extract in terms of context. Um, the tools available today are deficient in a lot of ways because at times, you know, for some blockchains, it it does take a lot of computation and computation is not free uh, just yet. Uh, we'll have some very hefty bills uh, when it comes to uh, you know doing these analysis. Uh, and that's just for Ethereum, right? In a multi-chain context, context is different between blockchains. Uh, there is some convergence in the Ethereum virtual machine and how contracts are broadcast, which I think is a net positive for the ecosystem. But not all blockchains are, are designed for transparency. To give you a sense of, 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 you know, one of the difficulties is that we've worked on adding all this context to Ethereum, right? So we have a lot of contextualized Ethereum transactions with, you know, tags that attempt to shed light on who's the entity that's transacting. Uh, you know, USD values, uh, aggregations, you know, this how much was sent in this specific point in time. Like daily aggregations can be very valuable as well. But um, 
that's just for Ethereum. If you look at something like Solana, all of that infrastructure um, has to be rebuilt. And a lot of, there isn't a lot of interest in building those things, unfortunately. Um, even by the folks that are writing the clients, the developers of the clients, they sometimes make your life, they try to make your life harder. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty insane. Like if you think about Solana specifically, Solana produces in one day more data, more state updates than Bitcoin produces in an entire year. So every day it's producing one uh, equivalent of one year in Bitcoin's history of, of new transactions. That entails a ton of additional challenges for us because in order to do this type of analysis, you need to operate at the block by block level. So you have to look at every single block in that chain's history. And parsing through, you know, uh, hundreds of terabytes of data is both incredibly expensive, uh, but also very difficult to bootstrap uh, and, and develop. Uh, all of that is happening in the private sector. There, there are very few kind of open source initiatives to, uh, you know, making this easy, easier. Uh, there's Aragon and Ethereum, which is a new client that makes uh, tracing transactions substantially easier. Um, but it hasn't really received, I think, the funding that it deserves. Uh, and it hasn't really honestly been used by folks other than, you know, the, the, the data companies in the private sector. So there is that intrinsic issue of the data being there, transparent in theory, but illegible, where you don't have enough context to get the full picture of a transaction unless you go through this effort that is both um, you know, time and, and resource intensive. Um, so that, that's one of the trade-offs to not, not all blockchains are made for transparency. And unfortunately. Yeah. And I realize we're, we're coming up on time, Ralph, sorry, I missed, uh, missed your question in regards to, uh, any kind of, uh, favorite self custody tutorial written for the average person. And I think I'll expand that to, you know, if there are any materials, both in terms of like self custody or privacy or anything, uh, yeah, that, that can be shared, uh, both, uh, Lucas or if anyone else knows any good ones, please feel free to drop them in, uh, the community channel. But yeah, Lucas, thank you so much for joining today. It was a, a pleasure having you, uh, hop in and, uh, share all the interesting work and research that, that you, uh, that you did around all the FTX uh incident uh and yeah just uh thank you to the entire community for spending time with us both today and throughout the year uh and yeah have a good rest of the year hope everyone gets a chance to enjoy and unwind a bit